Tony from CassetteComeback.com and since this is going to be the last video I do before Christmas I'm going to give you the video that a lot of you have bugged me for ages and ages to do even though I don't particularly want to do it because I have no particular interest in these cassettes but you keep asking and asking so here you go Merry Christmas and what is this? This video is on Type 3 cassettes. So, a lot of you might be thinking, especially if you're new to the hobby, what is a Type 3 cassette? I know Type 1's a regular ferric, Type 2's your high bias chrome, and Type 4's your metal. What's your Type 3? Well, the thoughts were that Type 1, your ferric, gives great bass, but is not so good at the treble. So the chrome give great treble, but the bass isn't as good as a ferric. So they thought, right then, why don't we combine them? Have a layer of ferric, which will give all the low end bass, but then a layer of chrome, so that we can get all the highs. Best of both worlds. Ergo, F-E-C-R, ferrochrome. That's what they are, ferrochrome. But they didn't last very long. To be honest with you, the reason that I've not been too interested in these cassettes is simply one, I don't have a deck which is specifically set up with a Type 3 setting. These all sort of petered out towards the end of the 70s, start of the 80s. Two, these are very hard to find cassettes. And three, they're also very expensive cassettes that again, I don't have a specific deck that has a Type 3 setting. So what's the point of me doing this video then? Well, luckily I have other decks which I'm pretty sure I'll be able to get a decent result from. I mean, if you uh, remember, I did a video on this, the Pyral Super Ferrite, thinking, what is this? There's very little about it. It says, you know, on the back, you know, Pyral's finest cassette. Test results inside each cassette. You know, this, this came across as high quality, and it turned out, with a bit of research, this was a Type 3. In fact, I did a video on it here. Bing! So if you want to watch that, do, because it's a bit more. So what I'm going to do with these is I'm going to record them as a Type 1 when it comes to the bias. So the biasing is going to be done as a Type 1, but the EQ is going to be 70 microseconds like a Type 2. So it's Type 1 bias with Type 2 microsecond EQ. So that hopefully should allow me to get a pretty decent recording on them if I use a good top end deck where I can select that. Now before I get on to it, this is my second BASF Ferrochrome. Now this might be painful to watch but I'm going to seek into a little video I did earlier when I was excited about opening this up and trying it and here's what happened. Ugh, Shed City. But it's good, look. One side, let's just get these out of focus. One side, black chrome. On the other side, brown ferric. So that's how it got its name, you know. Ferric on one side. Oop. And chrome on the other. But, uh, yeah, it's... Uh, Ugh, oh. Shed City. I tell you what, let's open it up and have a look at how bad this really is. So bear with me one second, though. Oof. Nice. Mmm. Lovely. Like I say, the, the tip itself, freaking outside, but I wonder why it was scraping off so easily in certain parts. Because this seems fairly flexible. If you look, actually, it's quite an interesting look. You see, like this, and then you can see different shades as you tilt it. But yeah, I mean, look at this bit. Look. 
is completely come off. The leader there, it's just, yeah, shedding away. Hmm. Which is a shame. Like I say, chrome, ferric on the leader, but yeah, it's this, yeah. So I posted that video on um, my Facebook group and a lot of people said, yeah, I've had that happen to my BASF ferrochromes as well. And yet some people said they're absolutely fine. So I've got a theory. This is a double opening. I'm going to open this one up again now because I have to say that these BSF ferrochromes came from another batch of tapes from the same era, but they were the, um, the chrome supers from the same person in the same style of boxes. So I believe they were probably all stored together and they're fine. But what I think the problem is, is this, the SM, the security mechanism. This is a mechanism that was done to secure the tape, make sure that it flows smoothly. But I think after time, this is a reason that maybe all the oxides getting stripped off these tapes. Now, when it comes to the SM, I take them out of cassettes now. I mean, you've just got to look at facts when you don't really know the truth behind stuff. And the fact is that BASF stopped including this SM in the mid 80s. It just disappeared. If it was really a brilliant mechanism that made a proper change that gave BASF more chance of being sold, why did they stop making it? Simple, because it didn't really make any noticeable difference. And I think now, it's more damaging than it is actually useful. So if you bear with me, I'm going to take this apart now and get rid of this SM mechanism and see if getting rid of it allows me to wind this without it shedding everywhere. So bear with me. So the SM mechanism is basically some little guides that allow the tape supposedly to flow freer and to keep it in place, to keep the pack tighter. But I think my suspicion is that now that these tapes are old, it could be storage on these particular ones. You never know. You know, they, they are as old. Well, the, what is it, 1977? I mean, the screws are a bit tight. I've got to be honest with you on this. Um, it's a 1977 tape. You know, it's 42 years old. If it's been stored a bit cold, then, you know, you've you, you got to expect there's some sort of degradation. I mean, if you take a 42-year-old data tape to someone and say, restore the data off this, they're going to go, no chance. So, you know, we have our expectations that all cassettes will always work forever, where sometimes it just isn't the case. You know, they, they can succumb. But I'm hoping, like I say, this is more to do with this security machine is, oh, I've got it. This is beautiful. I've got a bleeding screw that's threading up here. I thought it was only modern Chinese metal that threaded, not good old German 70s metal. We've got it now, though, but a bit tight. Okay, so. Okay, can you see the SM mechanism? It consists of this plastic thing at the top and these arms at the side. And my thoughts are, while this is spinning, this, even though it looks to be on the underside of the actual tape, it's not like it's scraping the top oxide. This is on the top of the tape, could be scraping the oxide. This makes it tight down the side. I don't know. I'm not entirely sure, but let's have a see. Let's see if I can just remove it. This is a tricky bit now. If you're always doing this, it's always the trick is to keep the tape as tight as possible. Right, it's around the pinch roller there. I need to get it around the pinch roller here. Bear with me, I, I'm not very good at doing this. I'm all fingers and thumbs, you see, and then it unravels itself on the top and it gets messy. Let's have a look. Okay, so far so good. So I've removed the security mechanism. Just, just have a look at some of this, I mean, you know, they're, they're quite pointy, pointy and sharp. You know, and we've got this rubbing 
along the top of the tape that's got an edge to it yeah. all I can say is I've done two full run throughs now with my little pocket winder which is kind of rough it is rough but it's fast and I've not seen any shedding on this so at this moment unless I put this in the deck and like I say I, I've got no level and no bias and it starts to shed oxide all over my heads I'm inclined to think that maybe it could be these things that are that caused a problem with the first one it just sort of scraped it off because it is fragile and like I say other people have said it but let's see let's see if we've got a bit of a handy hint there i.e if you've got a BSF ferrochrome take the SM, S, uh, the SM mechanism out so that's a BSF ferrochrome anyway like I say it's a, it's a nice shell um, BSF used a lot of these shells with the paper label retro cool does smell of chrome let's have a look at the actual gear card itself well it's got the nice gold lettering on it which um, one of my most nostalgic tapes actually was the Contact Audio Gold International which really did mimic this mimic mimic this hi-fi stereo blah 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 it's a look made in Ludwig's, Ludwigshaven uh, Germany not a lot else to say on this one so that's the BSF Ferrochrome and now for the pain the Sony, and I'll say this in my best father jack voice, Fecker. Um, yeah, don't write in if you're Irish, sorry about that. But uh, this is the painful one to open because um, I got some of these in a deal. And like I say, I'm not bothered about ferrochrome. I, I don't record them. I don't have a deck for them. But you guys like them and they're collectible. And I put these on my web store and they sold out within a day and this is my last one this is the only Sony FECR I have and I know this one if I put it up for sale now for $24.99 it would sell today but no I'm going to open it for this video which will generate $8 but hey that's just the way I am so uh, pain the pain the pain <laughs> oh, oh before I do let's look at the back let's look at the back ha <laughs> ha oh no this has got an SP mechanism again so that would just sort of saying to me I mean yeah it's a different one it doesn't seem to have anything physically touching the tape it's just like you know the sheet with the hub and the tape and all that newly developed and proves tape run characteristics resulting in elimination of uneven tape winding smoother hub rotation in fact they had this on um, same generation what's it called CHF and BHF and AHF but yeah so 45 minutes see bias medium so it's a normal bias but it's type 3 so normal bias like I say 70 microseconds that's how I'm going to record these so that's the back of it anyhow before we destroy the rest of it uh, oh, Merry Christmas everybody right I mean that's that's a very nice looking premium product I mean it was, I take it's going to be the shell of the AHF and uh, yeah, it's, it's a nice shell. It's nothing spectacular. Now it's retro cool, but the gold accenting looks good. What else we got? Oh, here we go. Interesting. Uses of the Ferrychrome cassette. Okay, well, the cassette can record as a tape selector for type 3. Set it to that. When it's... Okay, right. If the selector is 2 position type normal and type 2 cross, set it to type 1 normal. In this case, the high frequency range will be emphasised, so be sure to adjust the tone level to your preference with the tone control of the amplifier. When a cassette decker recorder with that tape selector is used, operate the set in the usual manner. In this case, sounds in the high frequency range will also require tonal adjustment. Okay, so what it's saying is if you don't have type 3, it's going to sound very trebly. You know, a bit like if you... Um, yeah, okay, that, that makes sense, yeah. So I, I am going to record this. Bias it as a Type 1, but I'm going to record it at 70 microseconds. Okay, cassette care, yes. Here's the frequency characteristics. With the tape like to set a Type 1, as we can see, it peaks. Ferric oxide, it stays pretty level, but then it, if you have it as Type 3, it, it drops off. So, yeah, and we've got that in French because this is the EU model. Very nice, yeah, I mean, I think that's part of the reason, you see, that Type 3 died off, because as Type 2 got better, and, you know, especially with the Cobalt Dope Type 2, it's sort of like, well, 
why do we need type 3? We've got to double layer it. It doesn't sound much better and everyone's already got a type 2 switch so why do we have to make text for type 3? So that's probably why you know they had to include stuff like this because this is someone described it as like the red-headed you know child of the cassette family you know the one that people just sort of go yeah okay but uh, there we go so that's the BASF Ferrochrome, the Sony Fecker and uh, now I'm just going to have a play with them and see which deck I'm going to be able to get the best results out of and see if they are really worth the hassle and the expense. The crowd. Okay, so I'm going to use my ZX9 for this one because it is my most flexible cassette deck. So, what we're going to do first is we're going to go through the uh, calibration of this. So, as you can see here, I've got the EQ set to 120, but that's for type 1, so I'm going to set it to 70 microseconds, but it's EX, which in Nakamichi speaks is type 1. So I'm going to bias this as a type 1, but use the EQ of a type 2. So there are test tones coming, I shall mute them down in editing, but let us get this calibrated up. So the first thing we do, press this, and it's the azimuth. But first I need to turn it to tape to make sure that it's actually doing the right thing. Okay, let's try that again. So the azimuth, as we can see there, is spot on. Which is good, so let's check the levels. Test tones now. Okay, the levels just needs to come up just a little bit on the right. Okay, let's check the biasing. Biasing's way over. Let's uh, dial the bias back. Okay, the levels will have dropped now. Oh no, the levels have gone up. Let's drop the levels again. And the bison has dropped off. Okay, so the biasing is fine, the levels are fine, and the azimuth is fine. Oh, the azimuth, yeah, it's nearly just a little bit of a tweak on the azimuth. Right, azimuth fine, level fine, bias fine. Goody gumdrops, right, so. Let us now record something onto this as a type 1 at 70 microseconds. Now, this tune I'm going to be playing now is a work in progress. It's not the world's greatest sounding more mixed tune at the moment because it's a work in progress, but I think it sounds good enough. It'll give you an idea of where Villa Rosso is going. We're going a bit, a bit rockier. Uh, this is called New York Night, and when I eventually get round to finishing it properly, if the singer stays with me long enough not to bugger off before I get the chance to release it, which usually seems to be the case, this will get released. But anyhow, for now, let's just have a little listen.
Hey, did you hear that? It sounded a lot duller as the tape than it did as the source. And there's a reason for that. You see, the Type 3 circuit works this way. When you're recording, it's recording as a Type 1 at 70 microseconds. However, when you play back with the Type 3 setting, it plays back as a Type 1 at 120 microseconds. That's why when we've been recording it there, it sounds duller when we listen to the tape than it does when we listen to the source. And that's one thing to bear in mind here, you see. Because if you think about it, a Type 3, I'll just take the BASF to show you, it doesn't have any special notches on it. It's, as far as the top of the tape's concerned, it's a Type 1. So that makes sense. You put it in a Walkman, you put it in a boombox recorder, whatever. You put it in anything, it'll play back as a Type 1. That's how it's designed. Play it back as a Type 1, record it as a Type 1, but at 70 microseconds. I know it can get confusing, but that is ultimately what I think the Type 3 circuit did. So when we were monitoring there between the source and the tape, the tape sounded duller. Well, don't worry. This isn't where it ends. So, like I say, I've run this through a couple of times. As you can see there, I've done some recording on this. Without the security mechanism, <gasps> this doesn't shed. This just works. So let's bias this one up now and see if the results are the same. Okay, let's get the azimuth back in alignment. It's amazing when you suddenly get that like this that so you can realise that the azimuth changes between tapes and even between the different sides of the same tape. So this is taking a lot of azimuth, so I'm going to check to see how far out the bias is. Yeah, the bias is loads out, you see, and so is the level. Let's try and get the level up a bit. This needs more bias than the Sony, so let's just get that, because if it's not in the right ballpark, if that's down there, it's never going to find the right azimuth. So we put it down there now, let's see, hopefully shortly we should be able to, there we go. Right, okay, the azimuth is locked in. The levels need tweaking a bit. The bias is a little bit over now. Let's go down. Well, it's still flickering a bit on the bias. Just give it a little more tweak. Come on, mate. There we go. Right, azimuth fine. Level fine. Oh, bias fine. Yeah, 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 yeah. There you go. That's good enough. Okay, so now we're going to record this one. But like I say, it's recorded as a tight one at 70. We're going to notice a difference between the source and the actual tape. The tape's going to sound a bit duller, but we're going to keep on doing it anyway. So let's do it. So yet again, sounded a lot duller than the source. 
and on top of that I could hear dropouts there I mean I know I've removed the security mechanism and this has been rewound and fast forward a few times and it is usable and stuff but I'm sorry I don't completely trust this to last very long and that's why I've got these in my web store sealed at the cheapest price on planet earth at £9.99 simply because I'm honest and I'm saying to you if you want to buy these to use good luck with that if you want a sealed one for the collection yeah if you're never going to open it get one of mine cheapest on planet earth but usable don't know however this deserves better so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to record the entirety of New York Night if you were enjoying it onto this Sony Ferrochrome and then I'm going to play it back as a tight one in my Revox and then we can listen and see how good these really are it's not a case of you know um, comparing to source and comparing it with the tape and listening for differences it's going to be something old-fashioned insofar as it's either going to sound good or it isn't. Simple. So let me just record all of New York Night onto this and then we'll have a proper listen to it played back as a tight one at 120 microseconds as it should be. Oh, isn't that nice? It's all Christmassy with the little red light and the little greens and the white. It's almost like the Christmas cassette deck. So... I recorded New York Night onto this on the ZX9 as a Type 1 with 70 microsecond EQ. But now we're going to put it in the Revox, which is going to find it as a good old Type 1 if my camera can focus, which it can't. There we go, it's found it as a Type 1. So now, if you don't like the song, this isn't going to sound any better, but just think about it. This is now how it should have been played back and how it would have sounded originally, regardless of whether you had a Type 3 setting or not. So just judge this based on the sound quality. Yeah, use your ears. Does it sound good or doesn't it sound good? Forget monitoring with source and the tape and comparing. Just enjoy the music for what it is, unless you don't like the song, in which case, fast forward about four minutes. Right, let's have a listen.
Has my noodling now changed my opinions of the Type 3? The Type 3 is a tip of two halves. Right now, because they're so hard to find, they're so expensive, and in the case of this one, like I say, it didn't shed then and then, but I heard dropouts, and I know the SM's got and it's usable, but I don't know how much I would trust this going forward. Are they worth it? Now, the Sony, as people have attested to, this is possibly one of the best Type 3s. I mean, the Scotchmaster 3, again, get one of them new old stock rocking horse doobie, you know. And likewise, I think it was the Denon DX5, is it? I'm not sure. Denon did one, it was supposedly superb as well. But right now, in this day and age, the collector's pieces, for what they cost and for how hard they are to find, you're better off getting yourself a good Super Ferric or a good Type 2. And that's ultimately why they died out, because the other tape formulations got so much better that there wasn't really a lot of need for them. When, you know, they did the Cobalt Dope of the Type 2, it was essentially, you know, the Cobalt was giving it the top end, which the Chrome was supposed to be doing in this, but it was doing it in an easier way rather than like you saw in the destruction video, it being a, a two quote, coat of ferrous on one side and chrome on the other. However, this one in particular, anyhow, when it was played back properly, sounded great. It really did. I'm not knocking that this wasn't a good sounding tape. I mean, the bass on this was superb. This has great bass. And this is why it's a tape of two halves, because right now, no, I'm not going to be hunting these out and buying them. However... Back in the day, I can't help but think these would have been the best cassette to do a mixtape on for somebody who wasn't really into tapes. Because they're not notched as Type 2s and they're played back as a Type 1. So that means they will give their best in pretty much any cassette deck, in the car, on a boombox, in a cheap hi-fi, in a shoebox recorder, that's where these will give their best. And yet, you can record them like a Type 2. I mean, okay, I didn't record these hot because it's still chrome at the end of the day, and you don't want to, uh, you know, push a chrome. But the bottom line is, you could have done a mixtape for that girl or that boy you fancied, recorded it on this, and it would have sounded superb, in whatever cassette deck they put it in. Whereas if you did it, say, on a pure chrome or a ferro-cobalt chrome uh, type 2, it might not have sounded as good because their decks might not have been able to play it back at 70 microseconds. Whereas old decks can play these back at 120 microseconds. So these would have been the ultimate tape to make a mixtape on to impress someone because they would have sounded brilliant. So, am I all turned around on these? Kind of. This, in particular, is a very good tape, and if I could get hold of loads of these at a reasonable price, then I probably would. It's no great hassle at the end of the day to record this as a Type 1 at 70 microseconds in the decks I've got. It's no big hassle, and then you can just play it back as a 120 normal Type 1 everywhere else. That would have been no hassle. These, again, like I say, I'm not sure of how long these have got left in them. But, Type 3 aren't trash. It's a shame that they didn't continue, but at the end of the day, in real terms, the manufacturing of them compared with the manufacturing of a ferro-cobalt type 2, which ultimately sound as good, if not better, as time went on, and debt manufacturers not wanting to have to put a type 3 setting on their decks 
when type 1 and 2 was already pretty much there and then type 4 came across and there we go. So that's why these died, that's why these rare and that's why these are collectible and to be fair I think they're worth having in your collection at least one. Just have a mess around if you've got a deck that can do it properly. So thanks for that and I want to uh, thank all of you for um, all of your comments mostly <laughs> throughout the year and uh, I just want to remind you about this. Bing! Now I've got two shows on on Sunday. The first one is a regular Retro Nouveau filled with cutting edge tunes for the more discerning palette and some retro classics. But then at 5 o'clock UK time on Sunday I will be joined in the studio by a couple of my friends. We're going to open a crate of beer and we're going to play Christmas tunes, talk rubbish and I don't know what's going to happen. So it could be possibly my last show but it could be a lot of fun too. So I'd appreciate it if you want to listen in and maybe send us a text or a tweet while we're on there just to, just to let me know that you're there. It'd be really good. But other than that, I want you to all have a fantastic Christmas and I shall see you in the new year. Or maybe I'll do a video between Christmas and New Year, depending what Father Christmas brings. <laughs> but other than that, please like and subscribe. And to all of you, a Merry Christmas and happy taping. Bye-bye.